Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We're so glad you're here today at the Norton Museum of Art for our talk on Henry Ossowa Tanner. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Glenn Tomlinson, and I'm the Chief Officer of Learning and Community Engagement here at the Norton Museum of Art. And um, if, I, if I could, just please uh, take a moment to silence your cell phones. And I would ask that uh, we don't take pictures or video during the course of the talk. Um, today's uh, program, like so many of our lectures and, in, and, and also concerts, um, is supported uh, with the generous, gen through the generosity of uh, the Gail and Paul Gross Education Endowment Fund. Uh, and so we are very grateful to Gail and Paul for their support uh, and for the support of their family. Um, we have a range of great uh, upcoming lectures and talks, and I just want to mention that um, this coming Friday, if you want to join us for Art After Dark, our next uh, lecture in this space will be a conversation, actually, between uh, New York-based artist Tom Sachs and uh, our cura senior curator of contemporary art, Arden Sherman. Um, if you'd like to see some of Tom Sachs' works, which are very entertaining and very, very um, interesting, um, there are three pieces currently on view in the Fisher Gallery, and you can see those today. So um, let me turn to our guest speaker, uh, whom I'm really delighted to introduce because she is the curator at uh, my uh, old stomping ground, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and it's just delightful to, to, to meet uh, staff who are there today. Uh, Anna O. Marley is the chief, uh, chief of Curatorial Affairs and the Kenneth R. Woodcock Curator of Historical American Art at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which she joined in March of 2009. She is a scholar of American art and material culture from the colonial era to 1945, and she holds her BA in art history from Vassar and her MA in museum studies from the University of Southern California, and finally her PhD from the University of Delaware, which as I'm sure you know, is a you know, great school um, uh, and, and center for American art. At uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, um, Ms. Dr. Marley has curated over 16 exhibitions, including, and I'm only gonna touch upon the more recent ones, the touring retrospective of Henry Oswa Tanner, Modern Spirit, which you see represented in the catalog cover on the, on the screen, um, and um, for that uh, exhibition, she edited the acclaimed accompanying catalog, which was published by the University of California Press. Her more recent exhibitions at PAFA include Spiritual Strivings, a celebration of African-American works on paper from 2014, and the five-venue National Touring Artists Garden, American Impressionism and the Garden Movement, 1887 to 1920. That was in 2015. Continuing on, um, she also uh, organized Thomas Aikens, photographer, in 2016, and From the Schuylkill to the Hudson, Landscapes of the Early American Republic in 2019. Women in Motion, 150 Years of Women's Artistic Networks at the Pennsylvania Academy, came next. And finally, and most recently, Marley's exhibition, Making American Artists, uh, just uh, created this year, is currently on view at the Pennsylvania Academy, and then uh, begins a multi-venue uh, uh, national tour. Her professional affiliations include serving as a former chair of the Association of Historians of American Art. Uh, she has been visiting professor at the University of Delaware, Center for Curatorial Leadership Fellow, and she has been an, on the advisory uh, board as a member of the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center in, at Vassar College, and she's a current advisor uh, board member for the Smithsonian Archives of, of American Art uh, for the journal uh, that they publish. Um, so without uh, any further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Anna Marley. Thank you all so much for coming to your Philadelphia pregame today on Saturday. Um, I, I am especially thankful for you coming inside on this beautiful day, but I hope you will enjoy um, some wonderful images and then you can go out and enjoy the beautiful fresh air. 
I'd love to thank uh, Glenn Tomlinson and my dear friend Ellen Roberts for inviting me here. When Ellen emailed me and said, would you like to come talk about Henry Tanner, maybe in February in Palm Beach? Uh, it didn't take me very long <laughs> to say yes, and so I have been a great admirer of Ellen's scholarship for a long time, so you are all very lucky to have her. Um, and I want to thank my friends from Philadelphia for coming out today as well. Um, so without uh, any further delay, I will get started. So um, Henry Oswa Tanner grew up in Philadelphia just after the Civil War, part of an educated and cultured African-American elite. The son uh, of a form of formerly enslaved Sarah Tanner and AME Bishop Benjamin Tucker Tanner. It was in the summer of 1872, the same year that the family had moved to a large eight-room home at 2908 Diamond Street in North Philadelphia, that young Tanner decided he wanted to become a painter. During a walk with his father, he threw Fairmont Park, the young Tanner spied a stranger painting a large tree. On the spot, he decided that he too would become an artist, securing 15 cents from his parents later that evening, for his first purchase of dry colors and a couple of craggy brushes. Thus began a journey of discovery for the young artist that began in Philadelphia and continued in Paris, Jerusalem, Cairo, and Tangier. Henry Tanner went on to become a critically acclaimed and prize-winning artist in the United States and France for what contemporary critics called his modern and personal religious painting. And I would love to share with you that this, this beautiful painting that you see here on the right, the watercolor, is currently on view, uh, recently gifted to the museum in a beautiful um, gem-like exhibition that you can visit after, after the talk. Um, for decades, he was a leader in the international artist community in Etaples in northern France. He counted among his patrons the French government, millionaires of the Gilded Age, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, American universities, and major American museums. He is an American artist of international stature, contemporary with other American expatriates, Sargent and Whistler, an artist who reframed genre scenes of black American life and Orientalist and religious painting through his innovative modern practices and techniques. The, the survey of American art history as a whole acknowledged Henry Osawa Tanner as a progenitor figure in and a leading influence on African American art history. In Framing American Art, which is a respected textbook on Amer American art history, Francis Pohl devotes a section specifically to Henry Osawa Tanner, not in the chapter on late 19th century art, nor in the section on American modernism but as a precursor to the Harlem Renaissance. Though Tanner was indeed an acknowledged influence on the artists of this movement, this slightly awkward uh, placement is emblematic of Tanner's perceived place in American history. As scholars have argued, when Tanner is included of, in surveys of American and Western art, his oeuvre is represented by one of his genre paintings of black American life, of which the artist made only two. Exhibitions throughout the last century and major humanities scholarship leave Tanner's legacy as the patriarch of black American art history undisputed, yet often pigeonhole his career as that of a major black artist. Henry Oswa Tanner, Modern Spirit, our exhibition that we did in 2012, complicated this story by exploring the important influences of the AME church, uh, teachers like Thomas Aikens, European Orientalism, modern technologies and artistic developments, and World War I on Tanner's life and work. In doing so, it added new dimensions to the story of Tanner as a black artist struggling to make his way in a competitive art world, revealing him as a modern artist whose training, intelligence, and faith equipped him to surmount the difficult realities of his time and propelled him into a lifetime journey of artistic discovery. He was born in 1859, the first of nine children in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Benjamin Tucker Tanner and Sarah Elizabeth Miller. Sarah and Benjamin met when they were students at Avery College just outside Pittsburgh. Benjamin Tanner 
went on to study at Western Theological Seminary and became an eminent minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which I'll refer to as AME. It's very well known acronym from, from now on. In addition to raising nine children, Sarah Tanner found time to organize the Might Missionary Society of the AME Church, one of the earliest societies for black women in America. His middle name, Asawa, derived from Osawatomi, the town in Kansas, where in 1856, the white militant abolitionist John Brown launched his anti-slavery campaign. Tanner enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, PAPA, in 1879, and was one of the first African Americans to study there. And some of you were asking about PAPA. Here it is. Here's a view of it. Um, and as, as early as the 1830s, uh, Robert Douglas Jr., a noted black Philadelphia artist, studied at the Academy, and he exhibited there in 1834. PAFA thus had the distinction of being the first art museum in the U.S. to exhibit a black artist. Paintings from his early days there as a student at PAFA show his engagement with animal subjects in particular. And I'm showing you here a scene of Pomp, an old lion at the Philadelphia Zoo, where Thomas Aikens encouraged his students to visit and study and draw from animals. Tanner was also so devoted to animal paintings that he purchased a sheep to serve as a model for his compositions. Tanner's first stab at the academic genre of history painting began under the tutelage of Aikens. Tanner had great respect for and was in turn respected by Aikens, who had a profound influence on him. As Tanner wrote later in life, quote, about this time, and when he was working on these paintings, Mr. Thomas Aikens, under whom I began studying at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, gave me a criticism which aided me then and ever since. It may apply to all walks of life. I will pass it along. I had made a start on a study, which was not altogether bad, but very probably the best thing I have ever done. He encouraged, but Instead of working to make it better, I became afraid I should destroy what I had done and really did nothing the rest of the week. Well, he was disgusted. What have you been doing? Get it, get it better, or get it worse. No middle ground for compromise. History and genre painting were popular subjects for Tanner's academy teacher, Aikens and Thomas Hovenden. And the subject that Tanner took for his first foray into the genre was the legend of Androcles, who was a Roman slave who shot, sought shelter from slavery in the cave of a lion. Androcles befriended the lion by removing a thorn from the lion's paw. Later, the slave was captured by the Romans and sentenced to death at the hands of wild beasts in the Circus Maximus. The beast turned out to be the lion that Androcles had saved, and the lion bowed to him, as would a domesticated pet. This touching sight inspired the Roman emperor to release both the lion and Androcles. This subject may have held particular resonance for Tanner, given the fact that his own mother had been born enslaved and had been brought to Pennsylvania by the Underground Railroad. Two studies for the painting, study for Androcles and lion licking its paw, um, show how accomplished an artist Tanner was becoming. And it's unfortunate that he never fi finished this ambitious painting. The lion is portrayed with great sensitivity. And when one compares it to Pomp, done only a few years earlier, you can see how much progress Tanner has made. His figure of the Sinui Androcles, likewise, reflects the hours Tanner had put into drawing from the Academy's cast collection and live models. He had clearly absorbed Aiken's lessons in gritty realism, as well as scientific observation of human anatomy. However, Tanner claimed that, quote, the ambitious canvas was beyond him. He had spent all his money on models without finishing the picture, whose scope, the artist argued, was beyond him at the time. By the late 1880s, Tanner had given up his ambition to be an animal painter, though he would continue to depict lions for many years. In this period, Tanner refined his landscape painting practice. One of his most exceptional landscapes from the period being Sand Dunes, Atlantic City. 
Um, Tanner spent many of his summers working in the black resort industry in Atlantic City. Beginning in the summer of 1876, he received encouragement from other painters working there. This landscape is in many ways a smaller version of the monumental landscapes being exhibited at PAFA um, in the mid-1880s, such as Alexander Harrison's The Wave, um, which was exhibited there in 1885, a work that had received honor honorable mention at the Paris Salon. The Wave was painted in Concarneau, France, approximately one year before Sand Dunes, and was a prize winner at PAFA. And this uh, at painting is currently on view in the green room at the um, White House. And we shared some stories about uh, one of your um, com uh, community members was actually at this event. Uh, this, this painting was the first work by an African-American artist to enter the permanent collection of the White House. And it didn't happen until the Clintons were in office and Hillary Clinton brought it in. So just shows to, goes to show you how, how much work we need to do here in terms of uh, uh, the history of, of art and, and um, particularly black artists in the United States. And so I'm showing you here some beautiful watercolor landscapes by him as well. And this very sort of moody, um, gorgeous uh, landscape painting that's in the Morris Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia. After a brief foray in Atlanta, um, Tanner arrived in Paris in 1891. He intended a brief stopover en route to Rome, but he stayed and he studied at the Académie Julienne, founded by Rodolf, Rudolf Julien and attended by many American artists. As a student at the school, Tanner had weekly access to Académies, drawings from the live model. One of these accomplished drawings is Negro Man, this is from the collection of the Detroit Institute of Art. Tanner's training at PAFA prepared him well for his work at Julienne, as you can see by the masterful handling of this particular drawing. In addition to the weekly drawing sessions, the students at Julienne were offered critiques by eminent artists like Jean-Paul Laurence and Benjamin Constant. A small group of urban landscapes from Tanner's first years in Paris show him developing his own style under the influence of French Impressionism and uh, James Abbott Neil Whistler. And I'm showing you here um, your beautiful painting here from the Norton of the Seine evening next to a beautiful Whistler. So they, were, they had studios near each other in Paris, and his fellow American expatriate was an, inter, was an internationally acclaimed artist. And Whistler was very celebrated for his nocturnal views of London, and he probably influenced Tanner's early work in Paris. These, uh, new, these were pretty newly discovered works when I was working on this book in, in 2012. Um, and it shows Tanner particularly intrigued by nighttime illumination in Paris. And Tanner's interest in nocturnes continued in his famous religious works, such as the work we began uh, the show with, and would also return during his scenes of World War I. Like many artists studying in Paris in the late 19th century, Tanner left the city for the French countryside in the summer. In the summers of 1891 and 1892, he traveled to Brittany, on the western coast of France, and whilst there, continued his experimentation in landscape and branched out into genre, or scenes of everyday life, focusing on scenes of French peasant life. Tanner um, completed three major French genre scenes in this time, the bagpipe lesson, the bagpipe player, and the young sabot maker. These paintings were Tanner's first submissions to the French Salon. Unlike the small landscapes he had completed, these large paintings reflect the influence of leading French salon painters rather than the Impressionists. So you have to realize there's all these competing art worlds going on in Paris at this time that he's, he's soaking in. They focus on narrative peasant scenes rather than landscape. And they represent Tanner's return to narrative painting. It's natural that Tanner should have turn to such scenes to make his mark in Paris, as many of his contemporaries from PAFA were also working in Brittany at the same time, including Cecilia Bowe, Alexander Harrison, and Charles Sprague Pierce. 
Tanner's narrative paintings were popular and successful in his native Philadelphia. In the, the article, The Negro in Art, H.O. Tanner's Latest Triumph, which was published in the AME Church Review in 1897, the author stated, we recall now that we once saw in the great Wanamaker store in Philadelphia a picture by Mr. Tanner, for which we were told the merchant prince paid a snug sum. This painting was in all probability the bagpipe lesson, which had hung at Wanamaker's Philadelphia Art Gallery in September of 1894 and in his New York Gallery in 1897, in which Wanamaker partner Robert Ogden hoped to purchase by subscription for PAPA, but eventually donated it instead to Hampton University, where he was a trustee. John Wanamaker, the owner of Wanamaker's department store empire, was also a patron of Tanner's teacher, Hovenden. And the mercantile magnet owned the latter's breaking home ties, which hung in his home. And I'm showing you that painting now, which is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Tanner used his time in Brittany absorbing the influence of modern French academic tradition of genre scenes, as well as his time exhibiting with Hovenden to create innovative paintings of black American life based on traditional genre scenes. He did this by creating respectful, naturalistic depictions of African Americans that stood in sharp contrast to caricatured 19th century visual representations. Tanner was not the first American artist to include black Americans in genre scenes, particularly scenes of music making. Similar paintings by Hovenden and Aikens were also popular in Philadelphia. Um, however, Tanner's unique contribution is the humanity, pathos, and virtuoso technique that he applied in his genre scenes. He adapted what he learned from his teachers at PAFA and what he learned in Paris and Brittany and infused it in his own early masterworks. His iconic genre series from the period include The Banjo Lesson, The Thankful Poor, and Spinning by the Firelight. Tanner would pay homage as well to his own upbringing during his brief time back in the US when he created one of his few surviving sculptures, Bust of Benjamin Tanner in 1894. This is a patinated plaster bust, and it shows Bishop Tanner deep in thought, almost as if he is in the process of composing a sermon or speech. With his faraway gaze and a prominent cross hanging at his neck, the sculptor casts him as a formidable figure, both intellectual and religious, a leader in this world, pondering the world beyond. Portrait of the artist's mother is a reinterpretation and personalization of Whistler's arrangement in gray and black, which Tanner would have the opportunity to see while a student in Philadelphia when it was on exhibition at PAFA in 1881. Another PAFA artist who was likewise influenced by this painting was Cecilia Beau, who did her own version featuring a mother and child, Les Derniers Jours d'Enfance. And I'm actually thrilled to say you should all come to Philadelphia. You should come anyway. But um, <laughs> this fall, or this summer, I believe, the Musée d'Orsay is loaning James Abbott McNeil's Whistler's painting to the PMA. And we are loaning our Cecilia Beau. And they own Tanner's portrait of his mother. And these paintings will be together for the first time probably ever. So if you do come and go to the PMA, but you need to say that I sent you, and you have to come to PAFA first. Um, so I'm very excited about this. In 1891, the year of Tanner's arrival in Paris, the French government had purchased Whistler's portrait of his mother. And in 1897, they purchased Tanner's painting of Lazarus. We'll get there in a minute. Scholars have certainly connected the Whistler and Tanner paintings of their mothers, suggesting that Tanner's visit to his parents' home in 1897 was a celebratory visit after the French government's purchase of Lazarus to hang with arrangement in gray and black in the galleries of the Musée de Luxembourg. The painting could not then be, should be interpreted as in, not in competition with Whistler, but as a text that the artist was rewriting for his own purposes. Tanner's mother is comparatively relaxed in contrast to the rigid puritanical pose of Whistler's mother. Both Beau and Tanner 
use reddish-brown Rembrandt-esque tones as opposed to Whistler's cool tones. This would be in keeping with Tanner's old master palette at the time. A pensive melancholia pervades both Beau and Tanner's compositions, similar to tonalist portraits of the time. A major shift occurs in Tanner's career around 1896. Dewey Mosby has astutely pointed out that although Tanner submitted both the banjo lesson and the bagpipe lesson to the French Salon, it was the latter with Brittany Denizens that were given a medal, while paintings with a distinctive race influence and character were ignored. Tanner's shift away from genre painting, as well as his decision to pursue religious painting at a moment in American and French art history was very timely and should be thought of as a strategic reaction to the pressures of the <clears throat> art market, as well as a reflection of the artist's genuine religious upbringing and faith. <clears throat> Tanner received his first major recognition in France with his Daniel in the Lion's Den, which was awarded honorable mention at the Salon an article in the 1897 AME Church Review advised readers that, quote, American art journals first began to apprise their public of the rising new star in Mr. Tanner when there was hung in the Philadelphia Gallery of Fine Arts, his Daniel in the Lion's Den, a subject in his favorite light effects. The Philadelphia Preacher's Meeting of the AME Church purchased this picture for $1,000 and presented it to the gallery. This painting was exhibited at PAFA in December of 1896, and then it toured nationally and internationally. And if you can ever find this painting for me, please let me know, because we don't know where it is now. In the 1890s, Tanner was an integral part of a group of Americans in Paris. He shared a studio with Herman McNeil in 1893. In the years around 1895, he was immortalized in canvas by Herman Dudley Murphy, a work at the Art Institute of Chicago, and in plaster by fellow PAFA alum Charles Grafley. That work is in the Met's collection. Tanner's major patrons of the 1890s were also a part of this group, not only religious leaders, but also, also wealthy, wealth, wealthy proponents and influential supporters of religious art and artists. When in 1895, Tanner joined the American Art Association in Paris, American merchant prince Rodman Wanamaker was president. Philadelphian John Wanamaker, the father of Tanner's patron Rodman, was a major patron of religious art and purchased works by the popular Hungarian religious artist Mihaly Munkesi as early as 1887. And I'm showing you here Munkesi's internationally famed paintings which were purchased in 1897 and hung first at John Wanamaker's country home um, until 1907 when a fire nearly destroyed them and then they were moved to the downtown department store. Was it his fellow Philadelphian Wanamaker whose family had been contem collecting contemporary religious art for over a decade who encouraged Tanner to take up religious painting? Likely it was a confluence of factors in addition to Tanner's own deeply religious upbringing that led him to infuse modernity into religious painting, thus becoming one of America's leading international artists at the turn of the 20th century. These factors likely included his interaction with symbolist artists in Brittany and naturalist religious artists in Paris that contributed to his moving away from genre painting to religious art as well as the sensational international popularity of Pascal Daniel Bouveret's The Lord's Last Supper in Paris at the Salon in 1896. Also, it is likely that Tanner was impressed by James Tissot's um, watercolor series, The Life of Christ, which premiered in Paris in 1894 and then toured around the US. Oh, no, we don't have a Tissot there. Um, including Chicago in, and um, was purchased by the Brooklyn Museum in 1900. In the summer of 1896, Tanner began work on the resurrection of Lazarus, which continued for six months. He began Lazarus by working on a much larger canvas, 
um, six by 10 feet, which he claimed a friend had told him to use. However, he soon gave up on that and returned to a smaller canvas. Tanner scholars, as well as contemporary reviewers, have noted his dramatic use of light, his monumental scale, his brown and gold coloration. In Tanner's Lazarus, the source of light seems to be the miracle, the resurrected Lazarus. Light spills out from the white drapery of Lazarus to illuminate a crowd of spectators emerging from the shadows. Tanner's spectators are brought into the light via the miracle occurring before them. Tanner's painting, however, is much more intimate than Daniel Bouvray's. And the rigid centrality of Bouvray's Christ, so you can see there and there versus what Tanner does with his work, is much more humble. Perhaps this is why so many critics saw Tanner's painting as infused with more personal religious feeding feeling. Both Tanner and Harrison Morris, the director of PAFA, wanted Lazarus to travel to Philadelphia. However, the French government, who controlled the Luxembourg Museum, where the painting was housed, would not loan it, for reasons that are unclear. In a letter dated September 22, 1897, Tanner wrote to Morris, quote, I am sorry to say that my picture will not come to Philadelphia as I desired. Of this, I am somewhat disappointed. Despite Morris's repeated attempts to get the painting to Philadelphia, Tanner again told him in December 25th of that year that the cause was lost. Morris lamented the fact that the French bureaucracy would not allow the painting to come to the US. Quote, we realize how difficult it would be to change the position taken by government officials, which you yourself have approved of. And I'm one of my proudest moments is that um, on working on this show, we were able to successfully negotiate with the Musée d'Orsay to get this painting to come to the United States for the first time. So uh, despite uh, Morris trying so hard in the 1890s, this finally visited the US in 2012 and uh, came to Philadelphia, Cincinnati, and Houston. And now it's back in Paris, and you can visit it. Um, on his return to Paris, oh, and here I am. That's me and um, my colleague uh, from the Smithsonian examining the painting in storage at the Musée d'Orsay. And one of the reasons the painting had never come is because you, you can see here, you see how it's sort of detaching from the frame. There's this gap. Um, and then you can see the original labels for the painting. So we had to pay the French government to fix it and to glaze it, the most expensive piece of glass I've ever put on a painting. Um, but so they weren't just, it, in our time, they weren't just being difficult, but we needed to protect and preserve the painting to get it to safely travel um, to the United States. Um, and then I'm also showing you another painting in Paris um, we had long thought that this painting, which is Tanner's, a portrait of his wife playing the cello, and you can see the bust of Graffley, by, uh, by Graffley of Tanner in the background, we thought this painting had been lost. It received a horrible review at the French Salon. Um, but actually, when I was looking at this painting, also at the Orsay with the conservator from the Smithsonian, we found this ghostly figure. And as you can see, that is the figure of Tanner's wife. So this painting was so badly reviewed that he recycled the canvas and painted this religious painting that was then bought by the French government. So if that doesn't show you why he, what strategic choices he was making in reaction to the market, I, I don't know what does. <laughs> so on his return to Paris, Tanner built on the success of Daniel in the Lion's Den and Lazarus with his salon submissions, The Annunciation and Nicodemus. It was also in these years that Tanner met his future wife, Jessie Macaulay Olson, who you just saw, a Swedish American woman from San Francisco who was training to be an opera singer in Paris. They would marry in 1899 and have their only child, Jessie Asawa Tanner, in 1903. In 1900, the critic Vance Thompson stated that with the Annunciation and Nicodemus, Tanner was destined to give the world a new conception of the Bible, and that, quote, 
Mr. Tanner is not only a biblical painter, but he has brought to modern art a new spirit. Critics during Tanner's time were aware that Tanner was creating a modernist vision of the Bible, not primarily an illustration, as had Tissot, but creating a unique, deeply personal vision. In addition to his own mystical treatments of the landscape of the Holy Land, one of the ways Tanner achieved this modern spirit was by infusing unique contemporary elements, such as the visual culture of electricity and modern dance into age-old biblical subjects, such as the Annunciation and Salome. A major deviation from Tanner's typical religious painting can be found in Salome, which is dated from 1902 to 03. But this painting doesn't appear anywhere until 1924, and it may never have been exhibited in Tanner's lifetime. In fact, its bold sensuality is not in keeping with the rest of his work. The dramatic color and light effects and the application of oil paint suggest it was made in the years immediately following 1900. In that year, Tanner would have been able to see his compatriot, Loie Fuller, dancing her famous electric Salome dance at the Exposition Universelle. There, Tanner exhibited two paintings, Christ Among the Doctors and Daniel in the Lion's Den. And Fuller had her own theater at the exhibition, was at the time the most famous American in Paris. She was known for her fully clothed dance where her voluminous billowing drapery was lit dramatically from below, and I'm showing you one of those performances. Tanner's Salome, like Fuller's, was also lit from below, almost if the glare of electric light is casting a greenish glow on the biblical dancer's face. Tanner and Fuller were far from the only artists who, whom Salome was an object of fascination at the turn of the century. Other symbolist artists were painting Salome as the quintessential femme fatale, including Gustav Moreau and Franz von Stucke in Germany. In 1907 and 1908, Tanner completed his largest canvas, The, Wy the Wise and Foolish Virgins. Again, this is another painting I need you to look for in your church basements because we don't know where it is. <laughs> um, newly discovered documentary evidence in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania suggests that this long lost painting was commissioned by Rodman Wanamaker for his department store, which explains why the painting is so big, 11 foot six inches tall and 16 feet wide. Yeah, bigger than anything he ever painted. The figures were life size and depicted in a grand interior. Wanamaker also owned versions of Return of the Holy Women and Christ and His Mother Discovering the Scriptures. The wise and foolish virgins and Christ and His Mother Studying the Scriptures were hung in the most prominent of all of Wanamaker's galleries, his Munkesi Gallery Annex on the ninth floor of the flagship Wanamaker Market Street, Street store in Philadelphia. They hung there alongside Munkesi's work and Benjamin West's Christ Blessing the Little Children until at least 1928, when an inventory was taken on, of the works on the death of Rodman Wanamaker. Their prominent position in the Wanamaker store may have influenced another path alum, Violet Oakley, or her patrons, to create a stained glass version of the Wise and Foolish versions for St. Peter's Church in Germantown in 1908. And that is actually now installed at PAFA, not in the church in Germantown anymore, which is now a school. The paintings may have remained in the store throughout the 1930s until they were sold at auction in 1939. And there the, tra the trail goes cold. Tanner's lifelong, lifelong use of photography to help him construct his figurative paintings is evident in the photographs of his wife, Jessie, and his young son, Jessie, that he used as an aid to construct two painted versions of Christ learning to read. Interestingly, the photographs of Jessie and Jessie are similarly composed to Tanner's early photographs. In this case, Jesse holds Jesse next to her, and, th and this is similar to how he used photographs uh, for the banjo lesson as well. At this time, Tanner infuses a diffuse spiritual atmosphere into his painting practice. 
and his paintings become less like the naturalist Dagnan Bouveret and are imbued with his own brand of mysticism. Christ at the home in Mary and Martha, the disciples see Christ walking on the water, and um, the three Marys are paintings from the height of Tanner's career, painted in his inimitable mystical style. As works such as The Visitation and The Three Marys, Tanner manipulates light and shadow and paint to emphasize the reaction of his figures to the holy events unfolding just outside the frame of the canvas. Drawing viewers into the paintings, they allow viewers' uh, t paintings to be, you can almost become a part of the biblical story, creating a personal experiential moment rather than telling the viewers a story of a moment that happened centuries before, such as a painter like Tissot would have done. And in paintings like this, Tanner's really channeling um, very modern ideas. He's, he's looking at Tesla and electricity in the way he depicts the Annunciation and the sort of disappearance of Christ. And he's also looking at modern Impressionism, particularly in this painting, he's looking at Monet and you can see how um, he's, uh, he's, the horizon line has disappeared very much in an Impressionist technique. After 1900, much of Tanner's time in France was spent at his home in Trepied on the northern coast of France, adjacent to the artist colony and beach resort of Paris Plage and the fishing village of Etaples. Tanner created numerous nocturnal landscapes, such as Le Touquet and the Calvary at Etaples, along with the genre scenes of the harsh lives of Etaples fishermen. Many of these paintings show fishermen returning from their labors or light at night, and prominent in many of these is a lantern, which the figure of which illustrates the artist's lifelong fascination with painting the effects of light and darkness. In 1917, after the United States entered World War I, Tanner, then 58, offered his contribution to the war effort by designing a Red Cross program to employ wounded and convalescing soldiers to raise fresh produce in hospital gardens. Tanner carried out this scheme on the eastern front of the war in the area around Neuf Chateau and was named Assistant Director of Farm and Garden Services for the American Red Cross. A group of paintings and sketches done on the Eastern Front remain some of the most intriguing works from the artist's late career. In his paintings of this period, Tanner excelled in merging the sacred and the secular, especially in nocturnal paintings suffused with deep purples and blues. Nearby this house was the military hospital that you can see here where Tanner worked, growing vegetables for American soldiers and his calm nocturne suggests a moment of repose and inspiration for Tanner and the soldiers he tended amidst the harsh deprivations of wartime. And I'm showing you here a beautiful painting that he did um, at the very end of World War I of the Arch, um, the Arc du Triomphe in Paris. Um, and you can see uh, uh, how this, um, this statue was placed in the middle of it for this short time just after World War I. Tanner's success with the resurrection of Lazarus inspired Rodman Wanamaker to pay for him to travel to the Holy Land. When he saw the painting in Tanner's studio, he remarked, there is Orientalism in Lazarus, but it's a fortunate accident. So Tanner first visited the Near East in 1897, and then he returned again um, later that year and in 1898 as well. Tanner's work from this period shows indebtedness to academic Orientalism. And when I talk about Orientalism, Wanamaker was probably referring to the works of 19th century French painters like Benjamin Constant, I'm showing you here, who used artistic elements derived from their travels in North Africa and Near East to depict aspects of these cultures in their painting, in their French paintings. Before traveling to Cairo and Jerusalem for the first time, Tanner had multiple opportunities to immerse himself in the contemporary visual culture of Orientalism, both in the US and France. In 1893, he traveled to the Chicago World's Fair to present a paper, The American Negro in Art. 
And while he was there, he had the opportunity to visit the street in Cairo. This attraction recreated the architecture one might find in a narrow lane in Cairo and included women performing the infamous belly dance. In the same year in Paris, the Parisian Society of Orientalist Artists was formed, and Jerome, who was Thomas Aiken's teacher, and Benjamin Constant were named honorary pre presidents. Both Tanner and Constant um, reveled in a sort of detail and decorative traditions. Let, yet Tanner, like his, uh, like his American compatriot Sargent, was also painting the architecture of the Muslim world at the time, seemed more interested in the play of light and dark and dramatic experience of interior of um, mosques. Um, and then you can see a beautiful loose brushwork here. Thus, when Tanner, when Wanamaker financed Tanner's first trip to the Holy Land, the artist was familiar with both images of the Orient that circulated in the US and France in the form of world's fairs, fine art exhibitions, and tourist photography. And these two recently recovered paintings, one of the interior of a mosque and one of the exterior, show how he may have been looking at tourist photography to help him complete his images after he traveled home. And here again, you can see he's using tourist photography uh, at, to complete his paintings. In the years after 1910, Tanner began a series of visits to French North Africa. There's some evidence that even before he traveled there, um, he was using photographs to paint North African scenes. In 1911, the artist had an exhibition in Chicago and showed paintings uh, titled Morocco and a Yemen Jew. This was actually before he visited Morocco. Both of these subjects and other works are only known by generic titles. So like his Jerusalem type of, of an earlier period, which he reworked later, he's really looking at French postcards and visual culture for these scenes. And you can see here some of the kind of uh, postcards he might be looking at when he's completing his scenes back in Paris. Again, a really nice comparison of a period postcard and one of his beautiful paintings. Also, he was uh, very influenced by stereography, which was this modern uh, photographic technique, which was, would create this uh, I, uh, experience of a slanted uh, view. And then again, I'm showing you a painting and then a scene from one of the world's fairs that he would have visited. And finally, he was actually um, in, uh, he was in Tangiers in the same time as um, uh, Matisse. In fact, they stayed at the same hotel. So I'm showing you paintings that they painted at the same time. Um, Tanner said that Matisse was a nice enough fellow, but he wasn't a very good artist. The period before the end, be, between the end of World War I and his death was difficult for Tanner. He lost his beloved wife in 1925 and suffered financial setbacks during the Great Depression. However, during this period, he was most successful in reinventing familiar subjects in a new light and experimenting with technique and materials. In the 1920s, Tanner ban began experimenting with tempera painting as part of his own version of modernism. And this is one of those examples. These last paintings form a very distinct body in Tanner's work and reveal his innovations in technique. Tanner took copious notes on his experimentation with technique. And as part of the book that um, we, wor we worked on for the show, we included a technical study that we conducted with Smithsonian scientists to recreate the recipes based on the back of the Tanner's paintings. The, these technical innovations, including Tanner's mixing of tempera and oil paint, are discussed in detail in the technical study of the catalog. And indeed, we did these wonderful panels about the scientific study of his work. And um, the Smithsonian, which has an amazing facility, did these uh, great microscopy studies. They can look at it under black light. They could do x-rays and recreate recipes, and they've continued to do this work even after the exhibition. 
and here you can see some detailed. Uh, my friend, who is a conservator there, chipped layer after layer of varnish off of this painting to clean it without destroying it. It took her uh, almost a year to actually clean this painting. So my advice is do not clean a painting unless you're working with a Smithsonian conservator. Don't clean a Tanner painting. <laughs> uh, not easy to clean. In 1936, when James Porter was facilitating the purchase of Return from the Crucifixion for Howard University, Tanner wrote to him saying, the figure groups have from the first gone rather well, except Mary and St. John, those I have painted over several times. What you say about the landscape is, I hope, true. Palestine always impressed me as the background for a great tragedy. Porter later wrote, that Tanner's unusual mix of tempera and oil in combination allowed him to build up a particular service to develop the same in rough textures in the motto of Basso Relievo. In preparation for this painting, Tanner created the marvelous Conte crayon and charcoal sketch study of Mary. The differences between the sketch and the finished painting are remarkable. The sketch reveals the quality of the artist's draftsmanship while the painting showcases how Tanner's experimental materials allowed him to create rough, highly built up landscapes, which the artist seems to have felt more successfully conveyed the feelings of tragedy that he experienced in the landscape of Palestine. The contrast suggests that while he used traditional academic techniques to begin his compositions, the final results were the products of years of modernist experimentation, creating a hybrid technique of modernist technique and traditional subject matter. This would be Tanner's final canvas. Thank you. And I am happy to answer questions. I'm also showing you three of the works by Tanner that are in PAFA's collection. Uh, two of them are in my current exhibition, Making American Artists, which is going to be touring around the country. So I, any questions you have, I would be happy to answer. And I have a microphone in case anybody would like that. Yes. I had a question. Um, um, did Tanner have any protégés, and did any of them res become as famous as he? That's a great question. Um, so Tanner did not um, have a, he did not teach. Uh, so he stayed in Paris and then he lived in the countryside um, in northern France. However, he was a great uh, mentor for many young American artists, particularly black American artists who traveled to see him. Uh, Laura Wheeler Waring, who uh, came after him at PAFA, went to see him. Um, a artist named Scott was probably the artist who uh, worked mo most in his style. Um, he, uh, a whole, the all, mo many of the Harlem Renaissance artists of the early 20th century would visit him in, in Paris. Louis Mello Jones visited him and he was always very supportive in supporting their career. But he didn't have one particular student who worked with him who then went on to sort of move his style forward. He was very unique, but always supportive of the next generation of artists. And he actually, you know, his work went out of favor um, in the early 20th century, um, in particularly because he was deemed by some um, black modernists uh, as not focusing on the black American experience. So then his work was not seen in the same way that an artist like Aaron Douglas, who was uh, very popular in the Harlem Renaissance, would have been seen. Um, so it isn't later until later in the 20th century that his work comes back into great recognition. Yes? Uh, the Making American Artists exhibition. So it's on view at PAFA until April 2nd. Um, and then it will be in 2024. It starts in Wichita, Kansas, and then it goes to um, it goes to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
and then um, UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina. But we do have a slot available this fall, and then also one in 2025, if you would like it to come to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think people in Florida would love this show. So um, yes, lobby your local museum director. <laughs> uh, there was another question? Yes. Yes, so what I would say was probably the reason he stayed in France was racism, um, but the reason he went there was very much the same reason any great artist of the United States in this time would go, because to finish your artistic training, you go to Paris. So his teacher, Thomas Aikens, went to Paris and then came back to Philadelphia. Cecilia Bow went to Paris, but then she came back to Philadelphia. So he definitely encountered virulent racism from at, at least one fellow student at PAFA. I would say that the faculty was very supportive of him, um, but he definitely incur he, there were, you know, it was a time of great racism in the United States. Um, and he was always very involved in supporting black causes, even though he was in Paris. You know, he, do, he do, donated money to anti-lynching campaigns. Um, plus, he also, he married a white American woman. And uh, at that time, his marriage would have not been considered legal in many states. So um, I think... It was this, I, well, I know it was the supportive environment of France that made him stay there. He said, uh, you know, in Paris, I am simply Monsieur Tanner, artiste américain. And he would never be seen that way in the United States in the time that he lived in. Yes? Yes, so he had one son, Jesse Tanner, who stayed in France. And then Jesse uh, Tanner had um, one daughter, uh, and I was lucky to meet her. She is a, a little older than me, and uh, she lives in the Champagne region of France and has two children. So the, that, his direct descendants still live in France. And they have, they've come and visited us in Philadelphia. And actually, I was able to travel through the Champagne region with them to visit the house of Joan of Arc, which is where he was stationed during the First World War. So we, we drank champagne, uh, and we saw where Henry Tanner worked during the First World War supporting American soldiers. It was pretty amazing. But then there are many nieces and nephews, you know, there were nine kids in the Tanner family. So there are Tanners all over the United States, including in Philadelphia, um, descendants of different uh, Tanner family members. And it wasn't only Henry Tanner that was famous. Um, one of his nieces, um, she uh, has a historical marker outside her house in Mount Airy because she was, I believe, the first black woman to receive a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She was an incredibly influential legal scholar and expert. So the whole family was amazing. Yes? That is a great question. He did, in fact, paint in Florida. Um, and I know of two great paintings of Florida both in private collections. One is in a private collection in Philadelphia, and the other, it, it was in a private collection, but it might be, it was in uh, Dr. Walter O. Evans' collection, but he has given some of his collection to the SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah. So that might not be in uh, Dr. Evans' collection anymore, I'm not sure. Um, but they're beautiful, and he did come down here. He, one of the reasons he got his parents to let him be an artist is that he had health issues. 
So they wanted him to work in a flower factory, but he got really sick. He had weak lungs. So he came down to Florida, and he went to the highlands of North Carolina for his health. So yes, he did come to Florida and paint beautiful scenes of citrus groves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think his whole family was incredibly religious. And I think they, I think that probably Bishop Tanner wanted him to be a minister. He was the oldest son. And Bishop Tanner was not just any minister. Like he was, he was a big deal. He was the editor of the major uh, religious publication of the black church. So I can imagine that that might have been a lot of pressure for a young man uh, as, as sort of sensitive and artistic as Henry Tanner. Um, so I think it was probably a really great compromise for him to become this religious painter. So I, I know that he always was very indebted to his faith, and he grew up with that, that religious upbringing, but also an incredibly intellectual religious upbringing um, because his father was a theologian. Um, and I recently was asked to give a talk at my Episcopalian church in, in Chestnut Hill about Henry Tanner. And my, our, our minister led a discussion of his works. And um, I'd never looked at them in that deep, deep faith-based way. But my, my, my friend, Father Eric, you know, the way he talked about the paintings was totally different. And he could make all these deep connections to uh, scriptural literature. So when you read the literature and then you look at the paintings, you're like, whoa, he's, he's like doing this like doctoral thesis of the word in the painting. And that's something that for me as, as not being brought up in the church, now that I am spending more time at a church, I have a new appreciation for. And I, I just got an email from an 80-year-old gentleman who, who said that as in his retirement home, he discovered my book on Tanner. And um, he said it was a really big tome, and I didn't want to read it. But he's like, I've been studying religion my whole life. And Tanner is amazing, and I'm so happy I read this book. And, and what I found is when we had the show up, we had so many people from church groups um, and synagogues come to visit and have a real emotional, spiritual response to the works. So I think, I think he does it better than anyone. And that's why I think he's the best, um, one of the best painters of the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Anna Marley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.